Like all of us, I enjoy automotive mechanics. I enjoy it the most when the outcomes are predictable. When an engine is basically in good condition, and we've analyzed this engine thoroughly in part one, the outcome of a tune-up is better fuel efficiency and performance. So let's get started on this tune-up and see that kind of outcome. A gasoline spark engine depends on igniting a compressed air fuel mixture. Historically, spark was delivered with a distributor ignition. Fundamental components included a distributor cap, rotor, and spark plugs. These components carry forward from the breaker point ignition era into the electronic higher energy ignitions. The 1999 XJ Cherokee 4 liter engine in this project is the last 4 liter engine to have an ignition distributor. A tune-up includes a new distributor cap and rotor, new spark plugs, and spark plug wires when required. I purchased these parts for their reliability and cost effectiveness. This is a set of spark plugs, a new cap, and rotor. The cap I always get with brass contacts. Better distributor caps are built with brass contacts. Cheaper caps use aluminum contacts. Brass contacts last longer, operate cooler, and do not oxidize like aluminum. This removed cap and rotor have been run for as long as possible. Though no apparent misfire occurred, the poles and rotor tip show excessive wear. This ignition, in this condition, would be producing high resistance and less spark voltage at the plugs. Carbon tracking and arcing have developed, which would soon lead to a distinct misfire. These parts are overdue for replacing. Fuel efficiency and performance were suffering. When I know the tune-up will be routine, I get the parts in advance. For the Jeep Cherokee engine, conventional spark plugs work well. These are copper core plugs. They happen to be auto light, a good value, and reliable. I pre-gap the plugs before installing them using a plug gapper that I've had for the last 40 years. A good plug gapper will save time and also make sure that the gap between the electrode and the ground strap is a parallel gap. Due to the clamping force, this type of tool only works on conventional spark plugs and not iridium plugs. Parts for a full ignition refresh begin with quality spark plugs. Bosch, Champion, Autolite, AC Delco, NGK, or Denso, each would qualify. This tune-up, the choice is Autolite Copper. The spark plugs get gapped to a uniform 35 thousandths of an inch for this cheap 4-liter engine application. The new brass contact Excel distributor cap and matching rotor provide the quality necessary for longer service. For spark cables, our choice is Taylor. Taylor offers a Street Thunder upgrade over OEM cables. Thunderbolt cables, proclaimed to be the last ignition wire set you'll ever have to buy, is the pick for this project. Thunderbolt is a superior, competition-grade 8.2 mm pre-assembled cable set made in America. The rating for this cable is competition level. We're not competing with any other vehicles, but we want reliability and cables that will last a very long time. Taylor Spark Cables are available for specific engine applications in red, blue, or black. As we move along in these projects, you'll need tools. I'm going to make tool suggestions and not based on look at how expensive these tools are, but rather the best tools to get the job done. And in many cases, it won't cost much. I'll make suggestions about tool options, those tools that are affordable, and those tools that can do a more thorough job, and those tools that will provide years of quality service to make your jobs easier and save you a considerable cost in the long run. This spark wire removal pliers has been in my toolbox for a very long time. Note how quickly I'm able to remove the spark plug boots without damaging the wires or the boots. Carbon core wires can be readily damaged if they are pulled on and stretched. Never remove the boot by tugging at the wire. This is a sure way to damage a reusable or new spark plug cable set. I'm going to share some variations of the boot removal tools. This is a tool that we're using in this project. It's a KD tool readily available. 
if you grip below the top of the boot and hold firmly as you pull out, you can generally remove the boot, wire, and terminal intact without damaging anything. This pliers set has been around since the late 1960s. I've had it that long. And it does a commendable job. It's fully insulated and you can remove the boot without electrocuting yourself. This is an inexpensive tool that actually gets the job done. If you look at the design, you reach down and under the base of the boot where it's over the insulator of the spark plug and pull out with the T-handle. It gets the job done. Keep track of each cable. The boots should be labeled if necessary so that when you replace the wires one at a time, they go back to the correct firing order and onto the right spark plug. I memorized the Jeep firing order over 50 years ago. It's common to GM six-cylinder inline engines as well. The Jimmy and Stove Bolt engines use this 153624 firing order. It's important to know which terminal in the distributor cap goes to the number one cylinder. Here, I'm removing the distributor cap by loosening the two screws that retain the cap to the distributor housing. On most distributors, this Jeep housing, as an example, there is a locating lug on the distributor cap for making sure the cap only goes on in one position. There is a short, high-tension coil wire that looks like part of the cable set, but actually goes from the center of the distributor cap to the coil. That needs to be removed as well. Lifting the distributor cap out of position exposes the rotor and the distributor. Inline four-cylinder and six-cylinder engines are much easier to service. This Jeep engine in particular is a traditional and easy to tune engine. This is a good ground school for those first wanting to try their hand at ignition tune-up. This ignition rotor is extremely worn. It has been exposed to so much heat and firing voltage that it literally is melting on its tip. The distributor cap and rotor really needed replacement. The longevity of these ignition parts is a testimonial to electronic ignition distributors. In the breaker point era, these parts would never have functioned properly at this kind of wear level or mileage. A high energy ignition and coil can fire despite this wear. If for troubleshooting purposes or possibly the reuse of these plug cables, there is a need to measure the resistance of the cables that can be done with a quality volt ohm meter. Here, the coil wire is tested. Note that I twist the coil wire to see if there are any breaks during the test. Compare the resistance figures to those figures in your factory workshop manual or specifications for this specific set of wires. This high tension coil wire carries more load than any of the spark cables. In the case of the six cylinder engine, this high tension cable has carried six times the amount of spark voltage of any other wire. This cap, rotor, and spark plug cables, OEM quality, have been on the engine for 60,000 miles. I expect performance and fuel efficiency to improve somewhat. Before removing the spark plugs, I always use a shop vacuum to vacuum around the spark plug areas. This is assurance that no debris will fall into the engine when the spark plugs are removed. I do not advise loosening the spark plug some and cranking the engine over to blow debris out. This always runs a risk of dislodging a spark plug under force. If necessary, use a pressure washer or go to the car wash and with a cold engine, clean the area around the spark plugs. This is best done at your shop or home garage with a pressure washer. The engine must be cold when you perform that task. Never pressure wash a hot engine. You can crack iron castings by spraying colder water onto a hot engine casting. Whether you're a professional mechanic or a serious do-it-yourselfer, the tools you choose for removing and installing spark plugs may vary. I'll share with you what works for me and what I've used for many years. Tops on my list would be my Champion CT451 Plugmaster 2 Ratchet. This swivel head ratchet has been in my toolbox for over 50 years. This is the most rugged 
and useful ratchet that I have. Although designed for spark plugs, it served a variety of applications. From Snap-on would be these two spark plug sockets, 5 8 inch and 13 16 inch hex. These are versatile, highly useful tools and the use of swivel is almost a mandatory if you want to avoid breaking porcelain on spark plugs. Each of these plug sockets has a rubber insert to protect the porcelain insulator and any type of spark plug socket you get should have a rubber insulator. An example would be this socket that has the rubber insert and is a straightforward 13 16 spark plug socket with a head that can be turned with a wrench if desired. This is 3 8 drive like the two snap-on sockets are. Believe it or not, some in the day and even to this day use a speed wrench for removing and installing spark plugs. A universal swivel is highly recommended as this will enable some sort of give, if you will, at the spark plug. I had a co-instructor at the San Diego Job Corps in the early 1980s who swore by the use of a speed wrench. And the technique that he used, which we all should use, was to leverage torque in this part of the handle and become used to the presets of 15 foot-pounds or 25 foot-pounds. Very easy to achieve with a speed wrench. Breaking sockets loose is not as difficult as you might imagine if you leverage the torque on this tool. Consider extensions a must. You will be using extensions on most engines. There are very few engines that I can think of in the modern era that do not require some length of extension to reach the plug. Speaking of modern, air tools, a 3 8 ratchet or air gun is acceptable for removing spark plugs. I'm not a fan of installing spark plugs with an air tool. One of the best air tools for removal of spark plugs has been my Rodak 3 8 drive butterfly air gun. And I've had this in my toolbox since the early 1970s. Built in Japan, this is an extremely rugged tool and versatile in that you can operate it with one hand readily toggling the butterfly. I get top service life out of all of my air tools and I attribute part of it to an inline oiler. I highly recommend this. Oiling your gun at the start of the day and working the gun the entire day on one charge is not enough. This has turned out to be the best solution for preserving air tools. While I never install spark plugs with air tools, I will remove spark plugs with a spark plug swivel socket and an air gun. This swivel socket has been in my tools since the early 1980s. It has a rubber insert and will not damage spark plugs if the socket is held in alignment. Remarkably, these spark plugs have been burning cleanly. This engine does not use oil. That's one factor. The air fuel ratios on an electronically fuel injected engine are closely controlled. We seldom see any kind of fouling of spark plugs on EFI engines. And when they do foul, there's usually something wrong with the fuel injector system or some other components. A misfiring ignition would be another cause for plug fouling. While distributorless or coil-on plug engines have eliminated spark plug cabling, they have not eliminated coil failures and other problems with the ignition. In fact, they've increased the number of coils on a given engine to the number of cylinders and this in itself can be problematic. In my experience, air impact tools can often have less damaging effect than hand tools, especially with aluminum cylinder heads and removing spark plugs from an engine like the Ford Triton, which has a history of problems with spark plug threads. The Jeep 4 liter is among the last engines to have both a cast iron block and a cast iron cylinder head. Thread integrity is not as much of an issue as long as spark plugs are threaded properly into the iron cylinder head. Here goes another round with the vacuum cleaner 
this time with a pointed nozzle to make certain that the cylinders are completely clear of any debris. I will share how to repair spark plug threads in a future episode. This one spark plug shows some carbon buildup. We know that we're getting adequate compression per cylinder and you can see that the plug was firing. This buildup of carbon, however, is something to watch. And recall, this is number five cylinder again where we have carbon buildup in the upper cylinder. This encourages us to use a scan tool, and we will, to see what the fuel trim is in the PCM management of air fuel ratios. The whitish deposits that you see on the grounding strap are an indication of poor fuel choices or heat. In this case, it could very well be just poor fuel choices. We run low octane fuel without additives in this engine and have done so for a long time. It's tolerant, but obviously it's taking a toll. Quality fuels like Shell or Chevron with Tecron help remove deposits and they also cool the engine slightly from that improved combustion and cleaner upper cylinders. We will concentrate on seeing that the engine runs as cool as possible, meaning a new thermostat, water pump, and so on, and also start adding seafoam as a gasoline supplement for the additive package. We saw excellent results in episode 2 when we cleaned the upper cylinders with seafoam using the SUR&R equipment. We'll continue to do that a few times to clean the upper cylinders. Despite the upper cylinder carbon buildup, these plugs actually look good. There are tan deposits that would be considered normal. The gaps are normal. And other than signs of poor grade fuel, we're in good shape here. This tune-up will make a difference. These spark plugs are now gapped to 35 thousandths and they will also be the right heat range. Always start the spark plugs by hand and carefully. The rubber insert in the snap-on swivel socket holds the plug in place. The plug is completely seated by hand before the torque wrench is applied. This is a 3 8 torque wrench and I'm setting the torque to the factory specification. Notice how I guide the spark plug in carefully, centering it up by hand with my fingertips before carefully starting the first thread. Do not bang the ground strap against the cylinder head. This will close the gap on the spark plug.
make certain that the rotor and the distributor cap are each seated squarely and securely with the distributor housing and drive shaft. The cap and the rotor each have a distinct position. Make certain that the cap is seated squarely and when tightening the screws, start them slowly on each side, gradually bring them up to snug, and then tighten them one side to the other until secure. The cap plastic can be broken if not handled properly. Do not over tighten the screws and make sure that nothing is being forced into position. If you're uncertain about inch pound torque, Get an inch pound torque wrench and quarter inch drive set. Practice with it on parts like this distributor cap until you're confident you know what the three newton meters or 26 inch pounds is equal to with the use of a Phillips screwdriver. Engines with electronic fuel and spark management do not require moving the distributor housing to adjust base timing. All timing functions take place in the PCM, ECM, or ECU. In the case of this 4-liter Jeep engine, the distributor is located properly when the number 1 spark plug lead is in the 5 o'clock position, the terminal that you see here. If the distributor has not been removed, and if the 5 o'clock position was number one wire before you started the tune-up, that will be the terminal you will use for number one spark wire. Once the number one spark wire has been hooked to the terminal on the distributor cap and the spark plug at number one cylinder, you can begin the other wire installations in the clockwise rotation of the firing order. Again, the firing order is 153624 clockwise on the distributor cap. The cylinders are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, one being at the front and number 6 cylinder at the rear. Although this particular engine is a Jeep inline 6 cylinder, the rules are general and the intent of this episode is to reach out to anyone who needs a tune-up on any gasoline engine. Consult your factory service manual for the firing order and the cylinder numbering if you have a V-type engine, the numbering per bank left and right. Be certain you understand the cylinder numbering as well as your engine's firing order. The spark plug cables of choice were Taylor Thunderbolt 8.2 mm. You can see the considerable size difference between these wires and the old wires, which were 7 mm Belden. Belden is a quality OEM replacement, but the Taylor Thunderbolt 8.2 mm wires will last considerably longer. A pre-made set like this Thunderbolt 8.2 mm for the 4 liter Jeep engine saves a great deal of time and assures that the connections are well done. For this inline six cylinder engine, the boots come in both straight and angled to suit the application and the positions of each of the spark plugs in the inline six cylinder head. After applying dielectric silicon grease provided with the set to the boots, it was simple to snap terminals into place and assemble these spark plug cables properly. Follow the instructions furnished with a cable set when applying dielectric grease to the boots and terminals. Since the muscle car era, I have built ignition spark plug cable sets from scratch. And there are tools like this MSD pliers that are specially designed 
for fabricating cable ends and terminals up to and including racing quality. The question is, is that practical for a production engine? If there is a cable set available that's pre-made, like the Taylor set for the 4-liter Jeep engine, there really is no point or cost effectiveness to building wires from scratch. Be aware that you can do that for custom applications, but it's really not necessary for popular engines. This happens to be another tool that I have in my long-standing tool arsenal. If you take care of tools like this MSD, crimping tool and terminal maker, they will last for a lifetime. I like to follow the original equipment guidelines and terminal blocks when routing wires. Notice that I follow the same flow that the original wires took. It's a little bit difficult with the 8.2 millimeter versus 7 millimeter wires to squeeze these wire insulations into the terminal blocks, but they ended up in position and they are secure. Notice that the angled plug boot is on the last cylinder. The central cylinders take the straight boots. Often, kits will not tell you specifically what the location is for each boot, and you have to use good judgment and whatever was in position before. On some engines, it's important not to run the wires parallel in certain firing positions. As an example, V8 engines, like the Chevrolet small block with a firing order of 18436572, you could not run number five and number seven spark leads close together for a long stretch. And in fact, it was advisable to cross those two wires at 90 degrees in one position so they wouldn't jump over current and cause crossfire. Fortunately, in the Jeep firing order of 153624, no two cylinders are firing successively in a row. As a result, it's not as critical when routing wires and there is no need to cross any particular pair. As an important point, any time you do a tune-up on an EFI, or Electronic Fuel and Spark Management System, be certain to clean the battery terminals and check the battery voltage. The minimal voltage for successfully running the PCM, ECM, or ECU is typically 12.5 volts. If there's too much resistance, or if the battery is defective or has a cell that's going dead, there will not be a successful tune-up. The static voltage unloaded on a fully charged 12 volt DC battery should be 12.6 to 12.9 volts, optimally 12.9. If the battery state is in question, get the battery load tested or consider getting a load tester and testing the battery yourself. Always keep in mind that on a DC system, the grounds are just as important as the hot leads and terminals. Make sure your battery ground and all other grounds are intact, not corroded, and making full connections.